Right, here we go. Uh, my name's William Lee. I'm from the uh, University of Plymouth in England. Yes, uh, that Plymouth do come along in 2020 for the 400th anniversary of uh, the uh, Pilgrim Fathers setting off and all that. I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, um, about does anxiety really keep you safer? Now, that's my laser. Yep, this is my... Here we are. There, there I am. Okay. So, um, so here we go. Uh, quick background, quick um, uh, description of the first study I did, which is in the National Survey of Health and Development, also known as the 1946 birth cohort. So this is when, just after the war, um, a, about 5,000 children born in the first week of March in 1946 were all uh, measured, and they're still being followed up. Only now they've got genotypes, and, uh, and they're all getting dementia these days and everything, so it's of enormous value. Um, but I used it much earlier on to look at whether anxiety keeps you safer. Um, and then a bit of literature, and then seven more studies at the end, which we're going to have to race through because, um, well, we're short of time. Okay, so here we go. So, um, so who, knows, uh, who knows a psychiatrist? There's one. Um, who, who knows uh, zoological explanations of anxiety? So there's competing explanations out there in the world for anxiety. So is anxiety, uh, is anxiety, now down here, now that's the zoology building in Aberdeen where I spent a certain time, amount of my time, and that's the medical school in Aberdeen, and there's only 1.3 miles between them, and yet, there it is, uh, and yet, you know, anxiety is very common, largely comorbid with depression, commonly treated in primary care, you know, anxiety is bad. Bad, surely bad to be afraid, you just heard. Uh, well, maybe before today. Okay. So, and it's associated with many poor outcomes. Excess mortality, that's loads, 70%. That's more than 20 cigarettes a day. Really bad, yeah. right? So, um, uh, so there's a bit more outstanding traits here, which we might skip today. Uh, and that's Hans uh, Isink, who, um, uh, it doesn't matter. Right, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, just, I just put him in there thinking, oh, we'll have plenty of time, but I realized that we won't. So there we go. So what about zoological? Who's that? Who's that? Captain Cat, the anxious cat, that's what he is, right? So anxiety is usually appropriately expressed, although we might have heard today that inappropriate expression might be often a good idea, but you'll understand that it's often, often appropriately expressed anyway. It's a good thing that keeps animals safe. Don't know what would be happening to this chap if he wasn't doing that, but it might be bad news. So, and it's expressed homolog homologously across species, so you will understand that that's an anxious animal, and certainly, when someone surprises me in the night, I arch my back, put my tail up, my bristle in it, my show my teeth. That's exactly what it's like, I can tell you. Right, and it's not a symptom. It's not a symptom. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll just batter that. So uh, everyone knows who that is. Everyone knows what that is. Uh, so I don't think we need to go on. And everyone knows who that is. So we can, uh, so we can skip these slides. Uh, and, and now, this book here is actually a little bit different to the book you might know, because Why We Get Sick in England was published under the name Evolution and Healing, which one day I'm going to ask Randy why that is, but I don't know. Okay. So, um, so this is a guy um, named uh, Lee Dugatkin, uh, who's a pretty amazing guy, and I don't know whether he's well known here, but he spent his time, um, he spent his time dividing up cichlid fish into, um, uh, pardon me, dividing up guppies into whether they were anxious or not and whether they got predated or whether they didn't. And he found that the anxious ones, no surprise to anyone in here, did save them, did protect themselves from predators better. And the good news is, since I started this whole trajectory, it started in 1996, making me feel very old, um, not only is there a load of fish data, but there's now a systematic review, including loads of other animals and you know, lynxes and cows and wild sheep and this kind of thing, showing that the anxious ones do keep themselves safer. So it's altogether a great news. So does your anxiety keep you safer? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask you again in a few minutes. Right. So uh, there's some fish. Okay. So there we go. So, um, so must one of these ideas be false? Now, who, who's English here? Who's British here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you know who that is. Um, and, uh, and everyone knows who she is. So, um, so must at least one be false? I'll skip these photos. So... Um, <laughs> The, uh, that was, a, that was a, a short stop of when I spent my elective um, time as a medical student with Randy in, uh, in Michigan. And it was a very happy time, but we don't have time for it now, sorry. So here we go. So, so what I set out to do was to assess whether high trait anxiety, while being common, heritable, harmful, has some beneficial effect. And the most obvious one being reduced risk of fatal injury. And why I stuck on fatal injury is because, um, because you can't hide a dead body and there's limited... Um, well, all right. But there's, a, there's limited room for reporting problems because um, someone who is anxious uh, is likely to report 
uh, an ambivalent stimulus as an injury compared to someone who's not. Uh, this is uh, Jeffrey Gray and uh, a couple of other players from before my time showed this pretty conclusively. So I stuck to fatal injuries for all the problems of rareness because it's a high validity measure. So that's what we did. That's what I set out to do. So the 1946 birth cohort I've told you about already. Um, and uh, they're quite followed up. And they get a birthday card every year. And, uh, and for this survey, which is uh, based on Torrington Place in London, I am there... Uh, I'm their visiting psychiatrist now, uh, whereby every three or four years they phone me up and say, one of our respondents is suicidal, please help. So I've got, a, I've got quite an ongoing relationship with this uh, survey. So when they were 13, in 1959, their, their teachers were asked the following question. How are we doing for minutes? Um, Ten minutes left. Okay, we're doing all right. So in age, um, age 13, would you describe this child as anxious? You know, as an anxious child, i.e. apprehensive, worried, and fearful. Now, in a rare moment of lack of genius, the uh, Medical Research Council, aged 15, asked them this related question. Would you say this child is apprehensive, worried, or fearful? So it's not quite the same. Annoying, hey? So not quite the same question, right? And age 16, and they have these uh, choices. But, um, but the, um, uh, these were binary choices, so unvalidated measures, but the, basically the teachers, an unrelated adult who knew the child well, they, um, they were able to just divide them. Is this an anxious one or isn't it? So this is the mental health thing. This is just, is this an anxious child or isn't it? From a, uh, an adult who's experienced with children and, um, uh, and knows the child well. So at age 16, there was a neurotism axis. Uh, I said a nice thing there, that's wrong. It's actually the Morsey personality inventory, which is the one that came before. So we've got three. Um, so, uh, so we've got uh, three personality or three anxiety measures. So uh, details and density of it, and we divided them into injury and not. There was no kind of automatic coding. I just eyeballed them all with my, uh, with my boss. At the time, we got pretty good agreement. We disagreed about the, uh, the alcohol ones, but we, we worked it out in the end. So here is a table, which I will skip, but here are the results. Um, here are the results. Now, what you've got here, now, can I walk with this thing? Oh, no, perhaps I'll just leave that alone. Right, I'll just do it uh, with this fellow. Right, so what you've got <coughs> is if we start at the right there, okay, You've got this dotted line, which is the anxious ones dying from non-injuries. And you can see, late in life, anxiety harms you, and you're more likely to die from heart attack strokes and all other non-injury things. So you can see, if you follow these two along together, these, these ones here, you, they are similar, different, okay? Where the anxious one's doing worse. Now, if you look at the thicker lines here, they are different and the same. Okay, so here you've got the anxious ones doing better for the injuries and then no different thereafter in the first bit of life. And then in the second bit of life, you've got the, uh, the anxious ones doing worse, but, in the, uh, um, uh, doing worse, but only for non-injuries. So, uh, so uh, game, set and match. Anxiety keeps you safer. Isn't it fantastic? I'm uh, going to be a prominent young scientist. Um, when, I, uh, when I got this finding, greyheads used to stop me in the corridor and say, hey, Will, you know, come and help me, come and see me if you need help, you know, and all that. It was fantastic. So then I completely foolishly set about to replicate this finding. <laughs> okay, so there's, there's a paper. There's the paper, you know, there I am, look at me, aren't I fabulous? And um, so there we go. So this was, this was the first story. So this was the, the first paper. Uh, the claim made in psychoeducation say to CBT for anxiety problems down some supporting evidence. Anxiety does keep you safer, which is great. And a minuscule contribution towards drawing lines in illness and health. Fantastic. This was pretty much the first paper I ever published. And the, the effect it had on the institution in which I functioned, I obviously thought, um, this is great. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. So then... So that's a 1946 birth cohort. Then I went to the Medical Research Council and I got enough money out of them to keep me going for four and a half years. And in that time, I replicated this study in these birth cohorts, three of those, 1958, 1970, and the Aberdeen Children 1950 study, which are British birth cohorts that are similar to the one I described already. Um, and also a large um, British survey called the Health and Lifestyle Survey, the Swedish Twin Register, the Hunt Study, which is a whole county. I'm sure you know the Scandinavians are amazing at this, but a whole county of people, 90,000 of them they targeted. They only got about 60,000 in the survey. So, uh, so that's what we set about to do. Now, there's a gallon of hypotheses here because I had to keep myself busy for a whole PhD. Um, but what I'll do is, is I'll just whiz straight to the graphs that will uh, tell you. So... Why don't we do these? And then I'll whiz right through the graph. So, so the basic deal was um, 
all cause mortality up to age 30. So I thought, right, rather than divide it into two, if it's keeping you safe, it's keeping you safe in terms of all causes, isn't it? It's not just keeping you safe for injuries, not for injuries. So if anxiety really is serving you, it's serving you by protecting you from death altogether. So that's what that one was about. Dose response, which is tertiles, oh, holy cow, right, tertiles rather than, uh, rather than a median split. And then uh, the case level, this idea that, you know, that as a bit of a, um, a bee in my bonnet, that, uh, that psychiatrists like me, like me are very happy to diagnose someone with anxiety, but maybe the threshold at which you get diagnosed is too low. So maybe case level anxiety keeps you, uh, uh, keeps you safe, you know. Um, and then there's the crossover idea. So it protects you early, harms you late. This crossover idea will be found. So, and then the underlying hypothesis is that, that the effect that anxiety has on your all-cause mortality over your lifespan is differential when you're a young adult compared to when you're an older adult. That was the, that was the whole project. So now a couple of things happened, um, which I think we might skip, actually. Sorry, Einstein. And sorry, Wistvedst. And sorry, Einstein again. And sorry, Daiku. Right, so, um, uh, right, so the process you've pretty much been through and the 46th birth cohort we've seen already. So here we are, the 1958th birth cohort. Mm, what do you think? The, um, the, um, the, the red one is the anxious ones for all causes. So we've got, so from the point of view of it harming you later in life, good. From the point of view of protecting you earlier in life, mm, okay, well, never mind, never mind. Maybe that was a fluke. On to the next one. <coughs> so here we are again. Mm, what do you think? Okay, never mind. Maybe that's two flukes. Okay, so here we go. Uh, here we are, another one in the 1958 birth cohort. Mm, it's not looking good, is it? Three against one. <coughs> never mind. Maybe the 58 was a crazy birth cohort. Maybe we'll go on to the 1970 birth cohort. Here we go. Mm, okay, maybe, maybe a bit of protection earlier on and harms you later. Okay, good. I'm feeling a bit better. Feeling better, I've got my eyes on that uh, tenure track position. <laughs> yeah, it'll be good. Okay, Aberdeen Children, 1950s. Hmm. <laughs> All right, three minutes to go. Right, so here we go. So what do you think? Okay, so we'll quickly whiz through these ones, but I can tell you it's a similar story, so we'll just whiz through these ones. Not good. Mm, they're definitely not good, because anxiety does worse the same, worse again. So this is what happens when you go out there and actually count things. You don't always get the answer you want. Okay. Mm, okay, I'm sinking, I'm sinking. <laughs> it's not looking good for me. Right, so who are our hypotheses? Oh dear. Oh dear. What do you think? Mm, maybe, but not significant. So, uh, so, oh dear, it's not looking good for me. Oh dear. <laughs> so who are the injury ones? Oh, sorry. Yes, so, right. Now, this is the whole thing about injury, which we're going to skip, okay? So the basic story is, it's the same story again for all of those bloody injuries. I tell you, by the end of this, I was fed up with this project. Right, so here you go. Right. Okay, not good for that one. Case level, no. Okay. Injury mortality, no. Okay, so here we go. This is, the, this is the dose response one, which we're going to skip again, but I, but I think you can probably guess the picture by now. <laughs> right? So here we go, here we go. So are you ready? That was the end. <laughs> I'm sure you'll recognise that. Right, so my questions for you are, we've got two minutes to go. Might it be to do with the age of exposure acquisition? Might it be to do with the epoch? You know, because they were these, the 1946 ones were asked earlier than the others. What, what if I was to do a meta-analysis? What if? How many minutes have I got? Okay. Okay, what if the, um, uh, what if the number of, f of injuries fell? So that is, that is injuries over time. And you can see that it just fell and fell and fell and fell and fell. So is it that we just lost power? You know, which is kind of believable as time went on. So there they are, meta-analyzed all together and with a low, um, uh, and with low heterogeneity. Okay, and here are the injury ones, similarly low heterogeneity. So the message is, it's lovely to have ideas, and I do believe I went out there to test one, but you don't always get the answer that you wanted. So, so here we go. So more, this is my last question for you, is uh, how much non-evidence do we need before you start giving up? Because when I talk to people about this, they invariably say, oh, but what does it mean? Because clearly anxiety is, is protective. So that's my question for you. Thank you very much.